10. That what our Saviour and his Apostles preached, and admitted men into the Church for believing, is not all that is absolutely required to make a man a Christian, or, that the believing him to be the Messiah, was not the only article they insisted on, to those WHO acknowledged one God, and, upon the belief whereof they admitted converts into the Church, in any one of those many places quoted by me out of the history of the New Testament, I say, any one, for though it be evident, throughout the whole Gospel, and the Acts, that this was the one doctrine of faith, which, in all their preachings everywhere, they principally drive at, yet, if it were not so, but that in other places they taught other things, that would not prove that those other things were articles of faith absolutely necessarily required to be believed to make a man a Christian, unless it had been so said, because, if it appears that ever any one was admitted into the church, by our Saviour or his apostles, without having that article explicitly laid before him, and without his explicit assent to it, you must grant, that an explicit assent to that article is not necessary to make a man a Christian, unless you will say, that our Saviour and his Apostles admitted men into the Church that were not qualified with such a faith as was absolutely necessary to make a man a Christian, which is as much as to say, that they allowed and pronounced men to be Christians, who are not Christians. For he that wants what is necessary to make a man a Christian, can no more be a Christian, than he that wants what is necessary to make him a man, can be a man. For what is necessary to the being of anything, is essential to its being, and anything may be as well without its essence, as without anything that is necessary to its being, and so a man be a man, without being a man, and a Christian a Christian, without being a Christian, and an unmasker may prove this, without proving it. You may, therefore, set up, by your unquestionable authority, what articles you please, as necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian. If our Saviour and his Apostles admitted converts into the Church, without preaching those your articles to them, or requiring an explicit assent to what they did not preach and explicitly lay down, I shall prefer their authority to yours, and think it was rather by them, than by you, that God promulgated the law of faith, and manifested what that faith was, upon which he would receive penitent converts. And though, by his Apostles, our Saviour taught a great many other truths, for the explaining this fundamental article of the law of faith, that Jesus is the Messiah, somewhere of have a nearer, and some a more remote connection with it, and so cannot be denied by any Christian, who sees that connection, or knows they are so taught, yet an explicit belief of any one of them, is no more necessarily required to make a man a Christian than an explicit belief of all those truths, which have a connection with the being of a God, or are revealed by him, is necessarily required to make a man not to be an atheist, though none of them can be denied by any one who sees that connection, or acknowledges that revelation, without his being an atheist. All these truths, taught us from God, either by reason or revelation, are of great use, to enlighten our minds confirm our faith, stir up our affections, and one hundred. And the more we see of them, the more we shall see, admire, and magnify the wisdom, goodness, mercy, and love of God, in the work of our redemption. This will oblige us to search and study the scripture, wherein it is contained and laid open to us. All that we find in the revelation of the New Testament, being the declared will and mind of our Lord and Master, the Messiah, whom we have taken to be our King, we are bound to receive his right and truth, or else we are not his subjects, we do not believe him to be the Messiah, our King, but cast him off, and with the Jews say, we will not have this man reign over us. But it is still what we find in the scripture, not in this or that system, what we, sincerely seeking to know the will of our Lord discovered to be his mind, where it is spoken plainly, we cannot miss it, and it is evident he requires our assent, where there is obscurity, either in the expressions themselves, or by reason of the seeming contrariety of other passages, their affair endeavour, 
as much as our circumstances will permit, secures us from a guilty disobedience of his will, or a sinful error in faith, which way soever our inquiry resolves the doubt, or perhaps leaves it unresolved. If he had required more of us in those points, he would have declared his will plainer to us, and discovered the truth contained in those obscure, or seemingly contradictory places, as clearly, and as uniformly as he did that fundamental article, that we were to believe him to be the Messiah, our King, as men, we have God for our King, and are under the law of reason, as Christians, we have Jesus the Messiah for our King, and are under the law revealed by him in the Gospel, and though every Christian, both as a diast and a Christian, be obliged to study both the law of nature and the revealed law, that in them he may know the will of God, and of Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent, yet, in neither of these laws, is there to be found a select set of fundamentals, distinct from the rest, which are to make him a deist, or a Christian. But he that believes one eternal, invisible God, his Lord and King, ceases thereby to be an atheist, and he that believes Jesus to be the Messiah, his King, ordained by God, thereby becomes a Christian is delivered from the power of darkness, and is translated into the kingdom of the Son of God, is actually within the covenant of grace, and has that faith, which shall be imputed to him for righteousness, and, if he continues in his allegiance to this his king, shall receive the reward, eternal life. He that considers this, will not be so hot as the unmasker, to contend for a number of fundamental articles, all that necessary every one of them, to be explicitly believed by every one for salvation, without knowing them himself, or being able to enumerate them to another. Can there be anything more absurd than to say, there are several fundamental articles, each of which every man must explicitly believe, upon pain of damnation, and yet not be able to say, which they be. The unmasker has set down no small number, but yet dares not say, these are all. On the contrary, he has plainly confessed there are more, but will not, one, e, cannot tell what they are, that remain behind, nay, has given a general description of his fundamental articles, by which it is not evident, but there may be ten times as many as those he had named, and amongst them, if he durst, or could name them, probably several that many a good Christian, who died in the faith, and is now in heaven, never once thought of, and others, which many, of as good authority as he, would, from their different systems, certainly deny and contradict. This, as great an absurdity as it is, cannot be otherwise, whilst men will take upon them to alter the terms of the gospel, and when it is evident, that our Saviour and his apostles received men into the church, and pronounced them believers, for taking him to be the Messiah, their King and Deliverer, sent by God, have a boldness to say, this is not enough. But, when you would know of them, what then is enough, they cannot tell you, the reason whereof is visible, viz. Because they being able to produce no other reason for their collection of fundamental articles, to prove them necessary to be believed, but because they are of divine authority, and contained in the Holy Scriptures, and are, as the unmasker says, writ there on purpose to be believed, they know not where to stop, when they have once begun, those texts that they leave out, or from which they deduce none of their fundamentals, being of the same divine authority, and so upon that account equally fundamental with what they culled out, though not so well suited to their particular systems. Hence come those endless and unreasonable contentions about fundamentals, whilst each censures the defect, redundancy, or falsehood of what others require, as necessary to be believed, and yet he himself gives not a catalogue of his own fundamentals, which he will say is sufficient and complete. Nor is it to be wondered, since, in this way, it is impossible to stop short of putting every proposition, divinely revealed, into the list of fundamentals, all of them being of divine and so of equal authority, and, upon that account, 
equally necessary to be believed by everyone that is a Christian, though they are not all necessary to be believed, to make anyone a Christian. For the New Testament containing the laws of the Messiah's kingdom, in regard of all the actions, both of mind and body, of all his subjects, every Christian is bound, by his allegiance to him, to believe all that he says in it to be true, as well as to assent, that all he commands in it is just and good, and what negligence, perverseness, or guilt there is, in his mistaking in the one, or failing in his obedience to the other, that this righteous judge of all men, who cannot be deceived, will at the last day lay open, and reward accordingly. It is no wonder, therefore, there have been such fierce contests, and such cruel havoc made amongst Christians about fundamentals, whilst everyone would set up his system, upon pain of fire and faggot in this, and hellfire in the other world, though, at the same time, whilst he is exercising the utmost barbarities against others, to prove himself a true Christian, he professes himself so ignorant, that he cannot tell, or so uncharitable, that he will not tell, what articles are absolutely necessary and sufficient to make a man a Christian. If there be any such fundamentals, as it is certain there are, it is as certain they must be very plain. Why then does everyone urge and make a stir about fundamentals, and nobody give a list of them? But because, as I have said, upon the usual grounds, they cannot, for I will be bold to say, that everyone who considers the matter, will see, that either only the article of his being the Messiah their King, which alone our Saviour and his Apostles preached to the unconverted world, and received those that believed it into the Church, is the only necessary article to be believed by an atheist, to make him a Christian, or else, that all the truths contained in the New Testament, are necessary articles to be believed to make a man a Christian and that between these two, it is impossible anywhere to stand. The reason whereof is plain, because, either the believing Jesus to be the Messiah, one. e. the taking him to be our King, makes us subjects and denizens of his kingdom, that is, Christians, or else an explicit knowledge of, and actual obedience to the laws of his kingdom, is what is required to make us subjects, which, I think, it was never said of any other kingdom. For a man must be a subject before he is bound to obey. Let us suppose it will be said here, that an obedience to the laws of Christ's kingdom, is what is necessary to make us subjects of it, without which we cannot be admitted into it. 1. e. be Christians, and, if so, this obedience must be universal, I mean, it must be the same sort of obedience to all the laws of this kingdom, which, since nobody says is in any one such as is wholly free from error, or frailty, this obedience can only lie in a sincere disposition and purpose of mind, to obey every one of the laws of the Messiah, delivered in the New Testament, to the utmost of our power. Now, believing right being one part of that obedience, as well as acting right is the other part, the obedience of assent must be implicitly to all that is delivered there, that it is true. But for as much as the particular acts of an explicit assent cannot go any farther than his understanding, who is to assent, what he understands to be truth, delivered by our Saviour, or the Apostles commissioned by him, and assisted by his Spirit, that he must necessarily believe, it becomes a fundamental article to him and he cannot refuse his assent to it, without renouncing his allegiance. For he that denies any of the doctrines that Christ has delivered, to be true, denies him to be sent from God, and consequently to be the Messiah, and so ceases to be a Christian. From whence it is evident, that if any more be necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian, than the believing Jesus to be the Messiah, and thereby taking him for our King. It cannot be any set bundle of fundamentals, culled out of the scripture, with an omission of the rest, according as best suits any one's fancy, system, or interest, but it must be an explicit belief of all those propositions, which he, according to the best of his understanding, 
really apprehends to be contained and meant in the scripture, and an implicit belief of all the rest, which he is ready to believe, as soon as it shall please God, upon his use of the means, to enlighten him, and make them clear to his understanding. So that in effect, almost every particular man in this sense has, or may have, a distinct catalogue of fundamentals, each whereof it is necessary for him explicitly to believe, now that he is a Christian, whereof if he should disbelieve or deny anyone, he would cast off his allegiance, disfranchise himself, and be no longer a subject of Christ's kingdom. But, in this sense, nobody can tell what is fundamental to another what is necessary for another man to believe. This catalogue of fundamentals, everyone alone can make for himself, nobody can fix it for him, nobody can collect or prescribe it to another, but this is, according as God has dealt to everyone the measure of light and faith, and has opened each man's understanding, that he may understand the scriptures. Whoever has used what means he is capable of, for the informing of himself, with a readiness to believe and obey what shall be taught and prescribed by Jesus, his Lord and King, is a true and faithful subject of Christ's kingdom, and cannot be thought to fail in anything necessary to salvation. Supposing a man and his wife, barely by seeing the wonderful things that Moses did, should have been persuaded to put themselves under his government, or by reading his law, and lacking it, or by any other motive had been prevailed on sincerely to take him for their ruler and law giver, and accordingly, renouncing their former idolatry and heathenish pollutions, in token thereof had, by baptism and circumcision, the initiating ceremonies, solemnly entered themselves into that communion, under the law of Moses, had they not, thereby, been made denizens of the commonwealth of Israel and invested with all the privileges and prerogatives of true children of Abraham, leaving to their posterity a right to their share in the promised land, though they had died before they had performed any other act of obedience to that law, nay, though they had not known whose son Moses was, nor how he had delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, nor whither he was leading them. I do not say, it is likely they should be so far ignorant, but, whether they were or no, it was enough that they took him for their prince and ruler, with a purpose to obey him, to submit themselves entirely to his commands and conduct, and did nothing afterwards, whereby they disowned or rejected his authority over them. In that respect, none of his laws were greater or more necessary to be submitted to, one than another, though the matter of one might be of much greater consequence than of another but a disobedience to any law of the least consequence, if it carry with it a disowning of the authority that made it, forfeits all, and cuts off such an offender from that commonwealth, and all the privileges of it. This is the case, in respect of other matters of faith, to those who believe Jesus to be the Messiah, and take him to be their king, sent from God, and so are already Christians. It is not the opinion, that any one may have of the weightiness of the matter, if they are, without their own fault, ignorant that our Saviour hath revealed it, that shall disfranchise them, and make them forfeit their interest in his kingdom, they may still be good subjects, though they do not believe a great many things, which creed makers may think necessary to be believed. That which is required of them is a sincere endeavour to know his mind, declared in the Gospel, and an explicit belief of all that they understand to be so, not to believe what he has revealed, whether in a lighter, or more weighty matter, calls his veracity into question, destroys his mission, denies his authority, and is a flat disowning him to be the Messiah, and so overturns that fundamental and necessary article whereby a man is a Christian. But this cannot be done by a man's ignorance or unwillful mistake of any of the truths published by our Saviour himself, or his authorised and inspired ministers, in the New Testament. Whilst a man knows not that it was his will or meaning, his allegiance is safe, though he believe the contrary. If this were not so, it is impossible that any one should be a Christian, for in some things we are ignorant, and err all 
not knowing the scriptures, for the holy inspired writings, being all of the same divine authority, must all equally in every article be fundamental, and necessary to be believed, if that be a reason, that makes any one proposition in it necessary to be believed. But the law of faith, the covenant of the gospel, being a covenant of grace, and not of natural right, or debt, nothing can be absolutely necessary to be believed, but what, by this new law of faith, God of his good pleasure hath made to be so. And this, it is plain, by the preaching of our Saviour and his apostles, to all that believed not already in him, was only the believing the only true God, and Jesus to be the Messiah, whom he hath sent. The performance of this puts a man within the covenant, and is that, which God will impute to him for righteousness. All the other acts of assent to other truths, taught by our Saviour, and his apostles, are not what make a man a Christian, but are necessary acts of obedience to be performed by one, who is a Christian, and therefore, being a Christian, ought to live by the laws of Christ's kingdom. Nor are we without some glimpse of light, why it hath pleased God of his grace, that the believing Jesus to be the Messiah should be that faith which he would impute to men for righteousness. It is evident from scripture, that our Saviour despised the shame and endured the cross for the joy set before him, which joy, it is also plain, was a kingdom. But, in this kingdom, which his Father had appointed to him, he could have none but voluntary subjects, such as leaving the kingdom of darkness, and of the prince of this world, with all the pleasures, pomps, and vanities thereof would put themselves under his dominion, and translate themselves into his kingdom which they did, by believing and owning him to be the Messiah their king, and thereby taking him to rule over them. For the faith for which God justifieth, is not an empty speculation, but a faith joined with repentance, and working by love, and for this, which was, in effect, to return to God himself, and to their natural allegiance due to him, and to advance as much as lay in them, the glory of the kingdom, which he had promised his son, God was pleased to declare, he would accept them, receive them to grace, and blot out all their former transgressions. This is evidently the covenant of grace, as delivered in the scriptures, and if this be not, I desire anyone to tell me what it is, and what are the terms of it. It is a law of faith, whereby God has promised to forgive all our sins, upon our repentance and believing something and to impute that faith to us for righteousness. Now I ask, what it is by the law of faith, we are required to believe. For until that be known, the law of faith is not distinctly known, nor the terms of the covenant upon which the all-merciful God graciously offers us salvation. And, if anyone will say, this is not known, nay, is not easily and certainly to be known under the gospel, I desire him to tell me what the greatest enemies of Christianity can say worse against it, for a way proposed to salvation, that does not certainly lead thee there, or is proposed, so as not to be known, are very little different as to their consequence, and mankind would be left to wander in darkness and uncertainty, with the one as well as the other. I do not write this for controversy's sake, for had I minded victory. I would not have given the unmasker this new matter of exception. I know whatever is said, he must be bawling for his fashionable and profitable orthodoxy, and cry out against this too, which I have here added, as Socinianism, and cast that name upon all that differs from what is held by those he would recommend his zeal to in writing. I call it bawling, for whether what he has said be reasoning, I shall refer to those of his own brotherhood if he be of any brotherhood, and there be any that will join with him in his set of fundamentals, when his creed is made. Had I minded nothing but how to deal with him, I had tied him up short to his list of fundamentals, without affording him topics of declaiming, against what I have here said, but I have enlarged on this point, for the sake of such readers, who, with the love of truth, read books of this kind and endeavour to inform themselves in the things of their everlasting concernment, 
it being of greater consideration with me to give any light and satisfaction to one single person, who is really concerned to understand, and be convinced of the religion he professes, than what a thousand fashionable, or titular professors of any sort of orthodoxy shall say, or think of me, for not doing as they do, one. e. for not saying after others, without understanding what is said, or upon what grounds, or caring to understand it, let us now consider his argument, to prove the articles he has given us to be fundamentals. In his thoughts concerning the causes of atheism, he argues from 1 Timothy 3. 16, where he says Christianity is called a mystery, that all things in Christianity are not plain, and exactly level to every common apprehension, and that everything in Christianity is not clear, and intelligible and comprehensible by the weakest noddle. Let us take this for proved as much as he pleases, and then let us see the force of this subtle disputant's argument, for the necessity there is that every Christian man should believe those, which he has given us for fundamental articles, out of the epistles. The reason of that obligation, and the necessity of every man's and woman's believing in them, he has laid in this, that they are to be found in the epistles, or in the Bible. This argument for them we have, over and over again, in his Socinianism unmasked, as here, thus, are they set down to no purpose in these inspired epistles. Why did the apostles write these doctrines, was it not, that those they writ to, might give their assent to them? They are in our Bibles, for that very purpose, to be believed. Now I ask, can any one more directly invalidate all he says here, for the necessity of believing his articles? Can any one more apparently write booty, than by saying, that these his doctrines, these his fundamental articles, which are, after his fashion, set down between the eighth and twentieth pages of this his first chapter, are of necessity to be believed by every one, before he can be a Christian, because they are in the epistles and in the Bible, and yet affirm, that in Christianity, 1. e. in the epistles and in the Bible, there are mysteries, there are things not plain, not clear, not intelligible to common apprehensions? If his articles, some of which contain mysteries, are necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian, because they are in the Bible, then, according to this rule, it is necessary for many men to believe what is not intelligible to them, what their noddles cannot apprehend, as the unmasker is pleased to turn the supposition of vulgar peoples understanding the fundamentals of their religion into ridicule. 1. e. It is necessary for many men to do, what is impossible for them to do, before they can be Christians, but if there be several things in the Bible, and in the epistles, that are not necessary for men to believe, to make them Christians, then all the unmaskers' arguments, upon their being in the epistles, are no proofs, that all his articles are necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian because they are set down in the epistles, much less, because he thinks they may be drawn, according to his system, out of what is set down in the epistles. Let him, therefore, either confess these and the like questions, why did the apostles write these? Was it not, that those they write to, might give their assent to them? Why should not every one of these evangelical truths be believed and embraced? They are in our Bibles, for that very purpose and the like, to be impertinent and ridiculous. Let him cease to propose them with so much ostentation, for they can serve only to mislead unwary readers, or let him unsay what he has said, of things not plain to common apprehensions, not clear and intelligible. Let him recant what he has said of mysteries in Christianity. For I ask with him, where can we be informed, but in the sacred and inspired writings? It is ridiculous to urge, that anything is necessary to be explicitly believed, to make a man a Christian, because it is writ in the epistles, and in the Bible, unless he confess that there is no mystery, nothing not plain, or unintelligible to vulgar understandings, in the epistles, or in the Bible. This is so evident, that the unmasker himself, who, 
of his thoughts concerning the causes of atheism, thought it ridiculous to suppose, that the vulgar should understand Christianity, is here of another mind, and, says of his evangelical doctrines and articles, necessary to be assented to, that they are intelligible and plain, there is no ambiguity and doubtfulness in them, they shine with their own light, and to an unprejudiced eye are plain, evident, and illustrious. To draw the unmasker out of the clouds, and prevent his hiding himself in the doubtfulness of his expressions, I shall desire him to say directly, whether the articles, which are necessary to be believed, to make a man a Christian, and particularly those he has set down for such, are all plain and intelligible, and such as may be understood and comprehended, I will not say in the unmasker's ridiculous way, by the weakest noddles, but, by every illiterate country man and woman, capable of church communion. If he says, yes, then all mysteries are excluded out of his articles necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian. For that which can be comprehended by every day laborer, every poor spinster, that is a member of the church, cannot be a mystery. And, if what such illiterate people cannot understand be required to be believed, to make them Christians, the greatest part of mankind are shut out from being Christians. But the unmasker has provided an answer, in these words, there is says he, a difficulty in the doctrine of the Trinity, and several truths of the Gospel, as to the exact manner of the things themselves, which we shall never be able to comprehend, at least on this side of heaven. But there is no difficulty as to the reality and certainty of them because we know they are revealed to us by God in the Holy Scriptures. Which answer of difficulty in the manner, and no difficulty in the reality, having the appearance of a distinction, looks like learning, but when it comes to be applied to the case in hand, will scarce afford us sense. The question is about a proposition to be believed, which must first necessarily be understood for a man cannot possibly give his assent to any affirmation or negation, unless he understand the terms as they are joined in that proposition, and has a conception of the thing affirmed or denied, and also a conception of the thing, concerning which it is affirmed or denied, as they are there put together, but let the proposition be what it will, there is no more to be understood than is expressed in the terms of that proposition. If it be a proposition concerning a matter of fact, it is enough to conceive, and believe the matter of fact. If it be a proposition concerning the manner of the fact, the manner of the fact must also be believed, as it is intelligibly expressed in that proposition. 5. G. Should this proposition be offered as an article of faith, to an illiterate countryman of England, he could not believe it, because, though a true proposition, yet it being proposed in words, whose meaning he understood not, he could not give any assent to it, put it into English. He understands what is meant by the dead shall rise. For he can conceive, that the same man, who was dead and senseless, should be alive again, as well as he can, that the same man, who is now in a lethargy, should awake again, or the same man that is now out of his sight and he knows not whether he be alive or dead, should return and be with him again, and so he is capable of believing it, though he conceives nothing of the manner, how a man revives, wakes or moves, but none of these manners of those actions being included in those propositions, the proposition concerning the matter of fact, if it imply no contradiction in it, may be believed, and so all that is required may be done whatever difficulty may be, as to the exact manner, how it is brought about, but where the proposition is about the manner, the belief too must be of the manner, 5. g. The article is, the dead shall be raised with spiritual bodies, and then the belief must be as well of this manner of the fact, as of the fact itself, so that what is said here, by the unmasker, about the manner, signifies nothing at all in the case. What is understood to be expressed in each proposition, whether it be of the manner, or not of the manner, is, by its being a revelation from God, to be believed, as far as it is understood, 
but no more is required to be believed concerning any article, than is contained in that article. What the unmasker, for the removing of difficulties, adds farther, in these words, but there is no difficulty as to the reality and certainty of the truths of the gospel, because we know, they are revealed to us by God in the Holy Scripture, is yet further from signifying anything to the purpose, than the former. The question is about understanding, and in what sense they are understood, not believing several propositions, or articles of faith, which are to be found in the Scripture. To this the unmasker says, there can be no difficulty at all as to their reality and certainty, because they are revealed by God. Which amounts to no more but this, that there is no difficulty at all in the understanding and believing this proposition, that whatever is revealed by God, is really and certainly true. But is the understanding and believing this single proposition, the understanding and believing all the articles of faith necessary to be believed? Is this all the explicit faith a Christian need have? If so, then a Christian need explicitly believe no more, but this one proposition, viz. that all the propositions between the two covers of his Bible, are certainly true. But I imagine the unmasker will not think the believing this one proposition, is a sufficient belief of all those fundamental articles, which he has given us, as necessary to be believed to make a man a Christian. For, if that will serve the turn, I conclude he may make his set of fundamentals as large and express to his system as he pleases, Calvinists, Arminians, Anabaptists, Sassanians, will all thus own the belief of them, viz. that all that God has revealed in the scripture, is really and certainly true. But if believing this proposition, that all that is revealed by God in the scripture is true, be not all the faith which the unmasker requires, what he says about the reality and certainty of all truths revealed by God removes nothing of the difficulty. A proposition of divine authority is found in the scripture, it is agreed presently between him and me, that it contains a real, certain truth, but the difficulty is, what is the truth it contains, to which he and I must assent. 5. G. The profession of faith made by the eunuch, in these words, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, upon which he was admitted into the church, as a Christian, I believe, contains a real and certain truth. Is that enough? No, says the unmasker, it includes in it, that Christ was God, and therefore it is not enough for me to believe, that these words contain a real certain truth, but I must believe, they contain this truth, that Jesus Christ is God, that the eunuch spoke them in that sense, and in that sense I must assent to them whereas they appear to me to be spoken, and meant here, as well as in several other places of the New Testament, in this sense, viz. that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and in that sense, in this place, I assent to them. The meaning then of these words, as spoken by the eunuch, is the difficulty, and I desire the unmasker, by the application of what he has said here to remove that difficulty for granting all the revelation from God to be really and certainly true, as certainly it is, how does the believing that general truth remove any difficulty about the sense and interpretation of any particular proposition, found in any passage of the Holy Scriptures, or is it possible for any man to understand it in one sense, and believe it in another, because it is a divine revelation? that has reality and certainty in it. Thus much, as to what the unmasker says of the fundamentals, he has given us, viz. that no true lover of God and truth need doubt of any of them, for there is no ambiguity and doubtfulness in them. If the distinction he has used, of difficulty as to the exact manner, and no difficulty as to the reality and certainty of gospel truths, will remove all ambiguity and doubtfulness from all those texts of scripture, from whence he and others deduce fundamental articles, so that they will be plain and intelligible to every man, in the sense he understands them, he has done great service to Christianity. But he seems to distrust that himself, in the following words, they shine, says he, with their own light, 
and to an unprejudiced eye, are plain, evident, and illustrious, and they would always continue so, if some ill-minded men did not perplex and entangle them. I see the matter would go very smooth, if the unmasker might be the sole, authentic interpreter or scripture. He is wisely of that judge's mind, who was against hearing the counsel on the other side, because they always perplexed the cause. But if those who differ from the unmasker, shall in their turns call him the prejudiced and ill-minded man, who perplexes these matters, as they may, with as much authority as he, we are but where we were, each must understand for himself, the best he can, until the unmasker be received as the only unprejudiced man, to whose dictates everyone, without examination, is with an implicit faith to submit. Here again, the unmasker puts upon me, what I never said, and therefore I must desire him to show, where it is, that I pretend, him to show, where it is, that I pretend, him to show, where it is, that I pretend.